Hey there, my Attachment Theory in Action podcast listeners and viewers. I'm your host, Jenna Kelly. And have I told you lately how grateful I am for your support by subscribing to this podcast and our YouTube channel, leaving comments, you know, it helps in that algorithm mystery that's out in the internet world. And the more you do that, the more we can get this information out. And that's, I'm feeling so compelled to say that today because the guest that I had the honor of sitting down with, Nat Wicked said, we need to get her and this conversation out to the world. She is a leader, a boss. She's a whole vibe around social justice parenting and where she's going to define that for us. We're going to talk about, um, you know, the inner work that has to be done for parents and caregivers, the things that can get in the way, practical tips. And I'm also going to direct you to some of the really cool offerings that she has if, if you're interested in learning more from her. So she is a dot connector, a norm agitator, a lover of liberation who supports social justice curious families in their efforts to practice social justice in their parenting while reparenting their inner child. Nat has, works as a decolonized semantic and licensed clinical psychotherapist, a transgender rights community organizer, child development specialist. And she's the host of a really awesome podcast called Come Back to Care, where she offers her really important insights into social justice parenting and breaks it down into these different nuanced and deep topics. But she does it in a way that also makes it really digestible. She's also received a recent award from zero to three for emerging leadership. And just this year, she received the equity champion award for the national training and technical assistance center for child, youth, and family mental health. So as you can see, she's a badass, and I can't wait for you guys to hear this conversation. I hope you feel as inspired as I did in sitting down and talking with her. So please enjoy and get inspired. Hello, Nat. Welcome. I am so thankful to be in conversation with you today on the Attachment Theory in Action podcast. I'm sending mm. you the warmest welcome. I hope you can feel it. Yes, Jenna, I'm receiving your warm welcome. Thank you so much for having me. The feeling is so mutual. Yes. You may not realize this, but when I first transitioned into host of this podcast fairly recently, I was kind of going scrolling through the names of who did, who do I want to invite on as a guest? And your name was one of the first names at the top of my list. Wow. Um, because you, the topic, especially around social justice, parenting and how that relates to attachment is what we're going to be talking about today. It is mm. so important in the work that we're doing. And I knew that it was information that our audience needed to hear. So I am so honored to, to have you joining. I knew it was just a question of, of when, not if. So <laughs> truly, thank you again for being here. Oh, so, um, yeah. so before we get into that rich topic of social justice parenting, like I said, and especially how it relates to attachment, let's start with one of your own attachment memories. Is there an attachment memory that feels important to you and your work that comes up for you right now with that invitation? I feel like this question should be the question we all ask people that we're dating or making mm -hmm. friends with at a bar or a coffee shop. Like, what's your attachment history like? I love it. Like, skip the small talk and let's get yeah. to the real stuff. Right. <laughs> Yes. And when I think of my own attachment history, I think of my relationship with my grandmother. I think both of them, actually, my grandmothers on my mom's side and my dad's side, who raised me in Bangkok, Thailand. I was born and raised there. And as a trans woman, way back when being with my grandmother it didn't matter how I presented myself, how feminine I was. I didn't have to worry if I was too much or not enough mm -hmm. or not masculine enough. I could just be me. 
Mm. And the memory that I thought about often was when one grandmother was teaching me how to cook. And Jenna, if you could picture a little boy and a grandmother cooking together in a kitchen, something that was only preserved for girls. Mm. But I don't know what my grandmother saw in me. And she wanted to teach me how to cook. Mm. I just remember the warmth of standing next to her, standing next to the stove and stirring her favorite pot of stew. Mm. That closeness that came. Wow. And that's that's when I learned that there's nothing I had to do to earn love and acceptance. Like that was the moment. And my other grandmother, she lived with us in the house that I was growing up in. And I would do fashion show (laughs) in her bedroom. Like we would close the door. I would try on her shoes, her slippers, her house coat, spritz on her perfume. And I would walk around the catwalk, which is like the area between her bed and her bathroom. And she would cheer me on. She would go, A, A, A. And then after I finished twirling, I would go in and she would hug me and kiss me. And kissing in Thailand, it's a little different. It's like sniffing. So she would sniff, plant one on my cheek, one on the other, and the last one on the forehead. Mm. And that's the, the attachment memories that, are really important to me yeah yeah Mm -hmm. I can see why also makes me feel all warm and something about your grandmother's wisdom both of them that you know went against the status quo and the norm and saw you for you truly you so such a beautiful gift that they offered you that was probably so needed. I'm so glad you received that from them. Yes. Yeah, I think of them often because I I often joke with the parents that I work with that it's because of my attachment with my own mother and father that I become a therapist. And all thanks to my grandmothers that I get to remember these rich attachment memories that can give myself corrective experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that might be a beautiful segue into defining social justice parenting. What What do you mean by that, Nat? Mm-hmm. I feel like I should have a succinct elevated or elevator pitch for this because it's what I live and breathe and practice every day. And I don't, Jenna. So it's an evolving definition. So bear with me. Sure, that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Social justice parenting is parenting that is rooted in social justice actions. Parents get to weave social justice concepts like solidarity, power with, and accountability, and so much more in how they show up day to day in their parenting and how they are raising their children. Mm. I often see when I do social justice organizing with my transgender and gender non-conforming communities that we're all on the streets fiercely advocating for prison abolition, equal rights, safety in workplace, against gender discrimination, all of that. And then these co-troublemakers that I organize with would go home to their children, and then they feel stuck. Mm. They, they they share with me that, you know, I want to abolish prison, but when I go home, I get triggered, and then I send my kids to timeout mm-hmm. or toddler or jail. Mm-hmm. And they're like, this is not right. I know it deep in my heart that it's not what I want to practice. What do I do? So that gave me 
like an invitation to explore with parents more about, huh, how do we embody integrity where we practice social justice in our community and also in our home with our children? How do we integrate the two together? Yes. And what we realized is that inner child wounds or attachment injuries and also internalized oppression wounds are often the barriers that get in the way of us being the parent we know we can be. So mm -hmm. the work that I do at the heart of social justice parenting is addressing the inner child wounds and internalized oppression wounds. Mm -hmm. It makes sense that it's an evolving definition. <laughs> it's so rich and we learn more and more as we go. And there's so much overlap with that definition with attachment and what we're trying to do in building secure attachment with babies and young children, mm. uh, you know, and so you really can't separate the two social justice and attachment because it's all of our innate human right to feel safe and loved. But unfortunately mm. that doesn't happen for all humans. And so bringing that in to the attachment and parenting relationship is so needed and important. Mm, yes, Jenna. Thank you. Because we, we talk about this all the time, providers and professionals, that whatever is happening on the macro level trickles down into what's happening in our home. Right. What's micro is macro and vice versa. Yeah. We don't live yeah. in, in a bubble even though mm -hmm. we might've felt that way during the pandemic, but we also saw then the ways that the, these larger cultural issues of oppression and racism impacted communities. So, you know, sometimes we might want to tuck our, our head in the sand, but it's, it's always there. So, it's always there. Mm -hmm. yeah. so let's bring this back into attachment a little bit more. And how does our own attachment histories then intersect with our comfort level and our ability to, you know, bring some of these social justice action parenting principles that you talked about into action. Yes. Whatever attachment strategy that each of us had to overlearn to protect ourselves when we were little right? These attachment strategy or inner child wounds get activated in the most intimate relationships with mm -hmm. our partners, with our colleagues, with our children, and of course, with the people that we mobilize and organize with in our communities. So with our attachment history or survival strategies, if you will, they also get activated when we are in the community organizing with people. And it shapes the ways we feel comfortable and safe asking for help, the ways we feel anchored in ourselves and our dignity enough to say no and to set boundaries, or the ways we feel safe enough to receive compassion from others. So it, it's the foundation of how we ask and receive help. And that goes into accountability. How do we don't become a savior? How do we not do social justice in a performative way? Mm. Mm -hmm. How's that resonating with you, Jenna? Yes. And I was telling you before we started recording too, how much I appreciated your, your own podcast episode, which your podcast is amazing. So we'll definitely be directing our audience to that as well around people pleasing. Is that another way that it may, our attachment histories may show up in our social justice oh, parenting? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, Jenna. Okay. Tell us I more. Am, oh, yeah. As a recovering people pleaser, in social justice organizing, I often see that I'll speak, I'll use myself as an example. When I make mistakes, and unintentionally hurt or harm someone that I'm organizing with. My attachment system kicks in right away. And my go-to strategy, survival strategy, is often people-pleasing. And it often looks like, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. 
I am more privileged in terms of my education level. Let me just move everything in my calendar off my schedule and I'm here for you. What do you need? I'll fix mm -hmm. it. I'm here for you. Do you want me to pay your rent? Do you want me to bring food for you? Do you want me to do childcare? Let me know and I'll be there. So with my people pleasing, essentially I remove my dignity, my boundary, and my humanity completely off the picture mm. to be overly accountable to that person that I hurt or harm. Yes, that explanation is so powerful. And recognizing that, you know, I come to this conversation and this work with a lot of my own privilege with my my skin color and, and gen, gender norm, fitting into gender norms and all of that. And yet people pleasing still also resonates for a lot of women, especially, and so much of our own attachment stories, whether we needed to take care of our parent or caregiver and put set our own needs aside. I mean, that's really the root of this. And then especially for, for, you know, people of color or other people of marginalized identities, the need mm. to stay s small and to appease or to take care of others because, you know, they're, that's rooted in, in survival. It is that centering other people who have power over us, meaning it could be our colleagues who are racialized in white bodies or our employers, right? We center their comfort to protect ourselves mm -hmm. and we abandon ourselves and our dignity in that process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And in social justice parenting, in the work that I do with parents, and it's now a running joke in, in our community, that parents now start saying this question to one another, like, oh my gosh, you feel the pressure to be perfect? Who's raising your child? Is it <laughs> capitalism? Is it white supremacy? Is it colonialism? Mm. Right. So we, we kind of name the root cause of our suffering and struggle. Yes. And, and remove shame off of ourselves. Yeah. That's another really cool example because I think it when you when you default to some of those perfectionist strategies or people pleasing, it's like then you're no longer present with who you are in your parenting and, and caregiving. And that breaks my heart, Jenna. Because mm -hmm. when I see parents, I'm in awe every time. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this for 15 plus years. I'm still in awe at how much love they have for their children. Mm -hmm. Despite everything they had to do to survive. And yeah. And to be able to reflect on, you know, how do I realign my parenting with my social justice values and heal their inner child wounds on top of that in the pandemic? Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. Right. Yeah. Such a tall order, but so important. You mentioned how social these social justice actions can can really be the portal in providing those corrective experiences for attachment injuries. Can you tell us more about that, Nat? What does that look like? Absolutely. In organizing and practicing social justice in the community, very similar to our work with families, the foundation of it is trust or therapeutic alliance, right? For that interdependence in the community to happen, trust is key and my community organizer partners might be able to sit with me in my discomfort when I say can I pay rent for you can I bring food can I offer child care I made a mistake I'm so sorry and they might be able to sit with me in my discomfort and say who that's not a centered apology hmm. Yes, you made a mistake. Yeah. And let's repair it. Mm -hmm. What might feel right for me to offer as an apology and an accountability action plan that feels good for the both of us. Mm -hmm. So 
So with that experience, it allows me to remove shame off of me, first of all. Second of all, sit in my discomfort. And third, really think of how do I unlearn this over-accountability that is in the form of people-pleasing? Yes. Yeah. We're all trying to unlearn something in this journey. And I really resonate with the people pleasing as well. So that's why I think I picked that as an example, but yeah. are there any other examples? Because that may not resonate for, for all of our listeners and viewers in the ways you see social justice, parenting and actions as, as a way to provide these reparative experiences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. We all have different kinds of stress responses, like our fight, flight, freeze, people, please, or shut down. Mm -hmm. And another example that I often see is the flight response where, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. I'm going to check out. I'm going to run away. I'm going to flee. And it often looks like intellectualizing. Mm where, oh my goodness, I messed up. So I must read another book, listen to another podcast, attend (laughs) a webinar, Mm -hmm. gain more knowledge. And until then, and only then, and this is perfectionism speaking too, that I will feel secure again to take action because I will not do any more harm, which we know in reality, it's just not how life works. Right. Yeah. So by really removing shame off of ourselves so we can hold space for us to be in grace and compassion and accountability, then we can unlearn this flight response and perhaps upgrade it a little bit where, mm-hmm. you know what? I noticed that I often run away to my perfectionism in intellectualizing and learning more before I take action. But this time, let me try doing it differently. I might just go in and apologize and say, you know, I don't have all the answers. I know I messed up. I don't even know what the accountability plan would be or how I would make it up to you. So I might need a little bit more time to sit with that. Would that be okay with you? Mm. And now come back and check in maybe next week. Yeah. Does that feel okay? Yeah. And it's a way to really advocate for your true authentic needs and to not know can be very vulnerable. Yes. Especially when you hurt someone Mm -hmm. and your intention is the complete opposite, right? Because you want to be a good ally. You want to advocate. You want to do with this thing that's really important to your social justice values. And this piece of, you know, when we react, right, when we make mistakes and do things that are not in alignment with our values, we react and then we revert back to our old coping habits. Mm -hmm. It could be running away and join another book club. It could be our fight response of, no, I didn't do anything wrong. You're being too sensitive. Mm -hmm. or people pleasing that we talked about like oh my feelings don't matter I hurt you so I'm gonna fix everything that I can Mm -hmm. and then we're stuck in these old coping habits and we often reduce ourselves into labels like oh see I'm never gonna be a good ally I'm such a people pleaser right but we have options yeah. And the more I hear you describe this, I it's just bringing to life the the ways that this overlays with parenting. It's really, you know, an attachment language that rupture and repair and that ability to be in that rupture and repair rather than retreating back into our defaults and our defenses, which is, yes. is really hard to do. It is. It's really hard to do. And I tell parents all the time, but you do this pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. You run experiments, you do trial and errors, and you get back up and you do what you got to do. 
Mm-hmm. So you already have that sense of accountability, rupture, and repair built in already. Can you talk more, Nat, about some some strategies and tools that you use in your work um, with social justice? Curious families was was a term that you used, which I love. Um, so if you want to oh. say more about that term too, but but how do you help them? Um, you know, with all the stuff that's going to come up in their parenting and in their social justice um, actions? Mm, yes. Um, self-reflection is one of the primary tools. I use self-reflection, journaling, and body-based or somatic practices. I, I'm building on top of the attachment research where when parents can make sense of their own childhood stories, They're able to see the children that they're raising Mm -hmm. instead of the children that they want them to be. Mm -hmm. So that's why self-reflection and journaling can really support the parents I work with in rewriting their childhood stories to make those narratives more coherent. And one example of that self-reflection is what I shared earlier that parents ask, who's raising my child? Is it my own values? Is it the in-laws values? Or is it capitalism's values? Right, And then they get to pause and step back and disidentify from the status quo that way. And that builds them enough space to ask, huh, is this really aligning with what I believe in? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> for parents to have that capacity for reflection, especially when they're so tired Mm -hmm. and triggered, surviving in white colonial capitalist patriarchy. I use body-based practices to help parents even noticing the smallest cues right before they snap and yell at their kids. Right. So listening to their body, especially when even when we're the most reflective human being, there's times where we lose access to that when we're stressed and tired, like you said. So I, I love this idea of, of really kind of bottom up approach of mm. let's go into our bodies and nervous systems and see what they're saying to us. And that, that can be hard too, but that it's a, it's a really important place to start. Yes. And, and it goes hand in hand, right? Jenna, the bottom of a the bottom-up approach of body-based practice and the top-down approach of Mm self-reflection. And for most of the families that I work with who are marginalized, BIPOC, queer, and trans, they had to disconnect with their bodies because if they feel it all, it would be too overwhelming. It would be too much. Yeah. So yeah. slowly getting back into reconnecting with their bodies and just wondering, oh my gosh, this this tightness in the shoulder, that's a piece of information that's important enough for me to pause before I go into my autopilot of tightness in the body, heat in the back of my neck, and then boom, I yell. Mm-hmm. Yes. And how do parents of, you know, from marginalized identities and communities strike a balance between, you know, acknowledging the real threats of systemic racism and oppression that they're raising their their children in, while also nurturing their child's sense of autonomy, hope, resilience, you know, so that, that there's a way that they don't have to be parenting from fear. And yet there's still these real threats. It, it's, it seems like such a difficult and challenging dance, all the more reason these, these tools that you mentioned are so needed, but are there, are there other ways that you support, um, especially parents who are, are BIPOC, BIPOC or from other marginalized identities with this huge task? Mm. That's such a very important and beautiful question, Jenna, because the threat is real. Yes. We look outside, we can see 5,000 issues. We mm-hmm. turn on the news and some days I just want to hide under under the table. 
is just too much. Mm -hmm. So when I support parents going through this, it's almost like I'm holding up a mirror and reflecting back their love for their child. Even though it looks like screaming at their children to get them to obey so that they learn how to obey the rules, the laws, the police officer, if mm -hmm. they get stopped when they grow up, so they know what to do to protect themselves and keep themselves safe. And acknowledging that tension there, that as providers who are well-versed in attachment theories, we always want parents to be what? Warm to their kids, to attune to their kids, and then we go into their homes and we see the complete opposite things. And I think this is where we need to really check our biases and really see what parents are trying to do underneath that seemingly harsh parenting strategies. Mm -hmm. And when I hold the mirror up and reflect that back to parents that I see that you're trying to keep your kids alive, mm -hmm. full stop, mm -hmm. period. Is that right? And they're like, yes. Yes. I've had parents I need them to listen. Yes. I've had parents tell me that. And and like you said, we have to check our own biases about and, and our own cultural expectations of what we think parenting should look like versus what what that parent identifies with, which is again about survival, trumps everything else. And if this is going to help my child be more prepared to survive in a world with these threats, then mm -hmm. this is how I'm going to parent. And it sounds like what, what you're inviting parents to do is to still do that. But to think about, again, I love that question. It goes back to who's showing up right now. Are you parenting in your defense system right now from a fear-based mm -hmm. place or can you get more present and grounded in your values and who you want to be and still teach your children that because those threats are still real, but do that from a more centered place. Yes. Yes. And I think that's the fun part for me it is to first really see the intentionality that the parents are doing. And once I see that the parents feel felt and seen and they're at the place where they're a little bit more ready to listen to my ideas too, right? Because it's not about us disregarding our own professional training, but it's coming together with parents. Then I can reflect with parents a little bit more. Like, you know, I want your child to be safe and protected too. And a lot of times children learn that safety and security from being seen and heard and loved. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how we can provide that to your, your child instead of teaching and teaching and lecturing and correcting their behaviors. What might that look like? Right? Or, wow, your child is really in full meltdown. And remember our discussion about their brain that they're not at that neurological bandwidth to really hear what you have to teach them. So how might we calm their nervous system first, then teach about how to be safe when they get stopped by the police later. Mm -hmm. So I don't do scripts per se, Jenna. I think parents often ask me, give me the scripts. What do I say to my child? So they do what I say, right? Because scripts, it, it's just not respectful to anyone's culture or style, especially the child's development. Mm -hmm. So I do agility instead, right? So asking, is it more adaptive? For you to teach right now or is it more adaptive for you to be with and be present with your child mm -hmm. and you'll know so you choose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes such good questions to to help parents and caregivers reflect and ourselves uh, in this work mm -hmm. um so do you have a, an example, maybe a success story or a, a challenging story? I'm sure any success story also comes with challenges, but let's bring this to life even more. Mm. A mom was raising a 10 year old and this summer, you know, he was learning a curse word 
flipping middle finger all around. And mom had this reaction right away of, if I were to do this with my own parents when I was little, I would get punished. I would X, Y, and Z, you know it. Mm -hmm. And for us to be intentional and practice social justice in this parenting, right? While we're getting really charged and triggered from our children's behavior, right? It's really tricky. So with this mom, she really had to ask, you know, is it adaptive for me to teach or is it adaptive for me to meet my child's need? And what would that need be? So I asked her, like, could it be a need for connection? Or could it be a need to be independent? If we think about two categories of needs in our attachment field. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know. It could be connection, I guess. I'm like, oh, how how so? Right? And she said, well, I guess, you know, he's nervous about back to school. And maybe he just wants to be like connected and made sure that I'm still there. I'm like, wait a second. And you were stressed earlier about not knowing what to do. <laughs> like you figured out what he was needing underneath that behavior that seems to be really pushing your buttons. So knowing that, how might you meet his needs? So he feels seen and connected. So he still feels reassured that you're still there for him. She's like, yeah, 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 I know, but I still have to teach him. I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> I know you have a lot of wisdom to teach him, but he seems to be needing that reassurance and connection right now. How might you provide that? Mm -hmm. So she took a week to figure it out and try something, which was, you know, having to make sure that during dinner time when she was cooking, she, you know, gave her 10-year-old a reassurance that, you know, I'm still here, but I'm cooking, you know, you can just sit here with me, watch something on your iPad. I'm still here. And that seems to work really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for her to teach him something, right? And the teaching part, she often goes into, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And to apply social justice into this work, right? When we talk about you need to do X, Y, and Z, it's more like power over that mm -hmm. has that texture of control, coercion, and domination in it. And we try to unlearn that, right? Because that's the, the texture of the prison industrial complex that we don't want. Mm -hmm. So this mom wants to, you know, it's more aligned with her values to power with, meaning let me collaborate with you. So she leads with her values. That's what we worked on. Instead of, you can't flip your middle finger around the house. That's not nice. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she's like, you know, I value kindness in this home. And those curse words and gesture really hurt my feelings. Let's come up with a new plan. If you need to say you're mad, then say you're mad. So I know how to be with you. Mm. How does that sound, right? Do you want to try that for a week and see? Mm -hmm. And they did. Yeah. Beautiful example of building more secure attachment with these social justice parenting action steps. I mean... Thank you for, for sharing that. And again, it goes back, this is going to be my new question, not just question of the week, but just question to that I, I is really resonating is, is who is showing up right now? Who is parenting your child? And we can apply that whether it's in a parenting context or any caregiving, teaching, therapy, any of our, in a, any of our interactions, who is showing up right now? Is it our values or is it our stress response system? 
Yes. Oh, Jenna, and what's coming to me right now is the same mom that I just shared with you. You know, she shared with me that by just being with, with my 10-year-old, she felt like she was saying those things to herself. Those kind and compassionate things that she didn't get when she was a child. And it just really shifted her parenting when she was able to be kind to herself. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. It, you talk about reparenting those inner child and attachment wounds. And I think when parents and caregivers show up in their more present regulated selves that that every opportunity of parenting their own child from that place is also an opportunity to reparent those inner attachment injuries Mm, yes yes and to just bid farewell to individualism i think that speaks to the importance of our role as providers when we work with families where we really hold space for them to be all of who they are. Mm -hmm. And we reactivate that sense of security and safety in their attachment system that might, might have been lacking. Right. So that they could tap into their inner wisdom and provide that safety and security to their children. Mm. Thank you for that, Nat. Mm -hmm. So tell us more. You shared that example. I want to hear more about this important work that you're doing so that people can learn about the offerings that you have and and any other resources you want us to know about. Mm, Thank you, Jenna. For parents and families, I run four times this cohort that's online and seven weeks. We talk about social justice parenting and also reparenting our inner child together in a small cohort of liberation-minded families. And we do body-based practices to address our triggers in the moment. We do self-reflection and journaling to understand where our triggers were coming from so that we can show up as the parents we know we can be. It's really fun. I love doing it. And that's the heart of my work. That's the paid offering. But for a free resource, that would be my Come Back to Care podcast, where I talk about this topic every other week. And I love doing that too. Putting research together in the podcast episode and linking social justice, parenting, attachment, it's ah, so much fun. Yes. Yes. You can feel that coming out in your podcast and then the work that you do, what you just described with, with the cohorts, the four times a year, mm-hmm. it, it's like, it's so much deeper than just going to a parenting class. Mm-hmm. Like this is an opportunity to, like I said, go, go deeper. We can all learn another thing. We can all read a book. But let's have this reparative experience in community with each other to truly reflect on what what is getting in our way. Sometimes these larger cultural messages and transgenerational messages like let's let's unpack this so that we can show up differently for our children. Definitely, Jenna. And I think one thing that capitalism and the medical industrial complex ruins us, especially parents, is that it instills this false idea that to be a better parent, they need to gain more skills Mm -hmm. and collect more skills and learn new things, new scripts to say. And we have like about 60 years of attachment research to say that, uh uh-uh, Mm -hmm. It's not about adding more tools to the toolkit, but it's healing what gets in the way of us seeing our children for who they are and meet them where they're at most of the time. 
Mm -hmm. When are you, I know you have a cohort coming up. When, when is it starting? It is starting September 6th. Sixth. And I have another one this year, November 1st. Okay, great. We'll make sure to link your website in the show notes along with your podcast so that people can, can learn more. It sounds like they're both such powerful offerings. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Are there any other resources or tools that you would direct curious people to? I would direct them to everything on my, in my work is on the website. I think of additional resources and send them to you so you can add them to the show notes for your listeners. Yes. But I know Shadok already has a beautiful, rich library of resource too. Sure. Yes. Well, like you said, it all comes back to the, that attachment research and yes. Yeah, so plenty of offerings out there and now just getting it in to parents and caregivers and teachers hands so that they can t- continue to strengthen all the important and amazing work that they're already doing. So because I think all I could ask for Jenna is for us to heal our internalized oppression wounds and inner child wounds so that we can bring our whole selves to abolish the system out there. That's not serving everybody. Mm. And that's not the end goal. That's the start. Mm-hmm. So we can really reimagine a system of care that's equitable and liberated. Amen. You must have known what I was going to ask you next, which was oh. if we were in a world with embedded and authentic social justice for all, what would you envision that that means for attachment and parenting and caregiving relationships? So we can expand the concept of attachment to include the healing that our ancestors could not do and embody that healing for the next seven generations mm. and expand the scope of our attachment to our relationship with the land and mm. the environment and the climate justice work that we're doing too. Because it's not just us. It's not just our family and, and the dyadic work. Right? It's community-based, it's chronological, it's intergenerational. Absolutely. Well, what a beautiful note of hope to end us on, Nat. I am so grateful for this conversation and the way that you inspire me and I know our listeners and viewers too, to embody more of these social justice principles within all of our relationships and all of the work that we do. So. Thank you. And I can't wait. I look forward to ways that I know that we will continue to collaborate and work together because we we need you. We need each other. So oh, thank you. We do. Yes. And you know, we're closing, but what just came to my mind, if I can say one more thing. Of Jenna. course. Yes. Because <laughs> that was such a beautiful closing you had. It feels like a big topic, right? Doing social justice, parenting, healing our wounds. It's like, oh, uh, Mm-hmm. It seems so big for many of us. And for many of us, like me, we don't have a choice but to do it. And we don't have to know everything about social justice or healing work right now. Because mm. I really believe that whatever we don't know and whatever we lack, we find in the people that we're with. Mm. So I hope we can bid farewell to individualism and perfectionism too. Yes. And really trust in humanity that we'll find it in people we work with. Right. We just have to be in it. Be in it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a process. And in our dignity. It's a process yeah. and a journey, but uh, another beautiful note to end on. So mm. thank you again, Nat. Thank you, Jenna, for having this beautiful conversation with me. Oh, it was my honor. Take care. You too. (laughs) Bye. Bye.